Yo, what's up? I'm Stu, State of Mind. This is my interview in the Czech Republic. Hi, Stu. Hello. Yo, how are you going? So, how was Prague yesterday? Um, you, I've also heard that you've, you've DJed in the Czech Republic before, a couple times in Ostrava and then Olomouc as well last year, I think. Uh, well, yeah, firstly, Prague last night was good, it was fun. Um, and secondly, yeah, we've DJed a lot in the Czech Republic. But there's two of us in the Czech Republic, uh, in ah, State of Mind, yeah. sorry. And so, have, we. Have you been here before? Of course, of course, but not, not Olom- Olomouc. Not all of them. No. Okay. No, this is my first time here, but Pat, the other half of State of Mind, he's I think he's come here at least two times. So yeah. I mean I I mean I've played a whole bunch of places around the uh, Czech Republic though. Um so so is Pat. Yeah, I mean it's a favourite one? Oh, it's pretty hard to go past Prague, to be honest. It's, <laughs> okay, it's pretty go. good. Have you played in Cross Club or Storm? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I played in both of those clubs. We played. So which one? Which one would you pick as your favorite? Oh man, okay. <laughs> can, can you that's not really a fair. From from a, uh, a DJ's from a DJ. point of view, um, Storm is cool because it's you know it's a bigger room. Um, from a punter's point of view, uh, Cross Club is pretty unique, you know, with all the the art, uh, the metal sculptures, and all that kind of shit on the walls. And um, so, I mean, both both those clubs are cool. I mean, I have played Cross Club half a dozen times, and I played Storm Club twice. So, could you tell us something about your life before drum and bass in Auckland, like school, first love, whatever, for success with drum programming, sure. anything really. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> drum and bass really has been a pretty big part of my life. Uh, but before that, both me and Pat were both trying badly to make electronic music. Um, I think if I remember, uh, my first equipment I ever bought, I, I bought it on hire purchase and I had like no money, but I went out and bought it anyway. I bought those um, Korg, these, these things called the Korg Electribes. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, one was a sequencer, and one was like a kind of a drum machine, like a rip off of a an eight oh eight or something. I, I can't really remember. And that was my first uh, attempt at making music electronically. And it, <laughs> <laughs> shit, it's, it, it's all falling down. Yeah, and it, yeah, did, yeah. it didn't it didn't go so well. But um, you know, you I, I carried on. Background at all? Uh, well, I used to play kind of I uh, play guitar, guitar ever since I was younger, and awesome. I uh, I kind of come from um, musically. Uh, kind of grunge rock kind of background so I was always big on your kind of you know your classic sound gardens and nirvanas and nine inch nails and all that kind of stuff and I, and I think it's why um, we kind of gravitated towards drum and bass because it's definitely in the electronic world kind of the d- the darker music I think or more open to you know being kind of metally and thrashy and dark a lot more than house music or something like that is um, so yeah, that's kind of the background, I guess. And then me and Pat just met up, and he was making music, and I was making music, and we we're both into drum and bass, and we we're like, well, should we make a tune together? And uh, yeah, the first tune we made, uh, I think uh, Urban Takeover wanted to sign it, if I remember rightly. It was the first tune we ever made, and uh, thankfully we said no. We we're like, no, we don't want to sign it, because we didn't think we were we didn't think we were good enough to put music out. Oh. And so we kept we kept working for a couple more years and um, built up like a. Mm. collection of tracks and then yeah then we were ready to hit the ground running i wanted always wanted to know because there are two two years that you know stayed that you started 2004 and then 2002 but i think it's 2002 right because you you've uh, had releases prior to 2004 right uh no i'm pretty sure 2004 was our first release um okay. that that was we, our, f- our first ever vinyl release i, I remember was on technique um, Simon Baseline and Smith's yeah. label. Okay. Uh, I can't actually remember the name of the tune. <laughs> it probably wasn't a very good tune, but whatever. That was that was our that was our, yeah, what, as you like. Uh, that was our first release, and then I think uh, CIA came really close after that, and that was with that um, State of Mind Experience series that had, you know, Sun King and uh, Rue McCoy and the kind of old kind of classic kind of stuff. But it all happened around that around the same time, more or less. Um, because like I said we would built up a lot of tracks we had I don't know like 20 tracks written and then we sort of pitched them out to all the labels and a lot of labels were into the stuff and we had like a bit of a signing frenzy right. and then awesome. it, yeah and that was kind of how it started which I think to be honest a lot of producers these days they 
they make the mistake of writing you know two tracks and then they're like these are the best tracks I've ever made and they send them to like loads of different labels and then you know they're not they don't they're not experienced enough they don't have the, the back catalogue they haven't spent enough time just making music and really refining their own personal sound and um, that's the advice I always give to that's a good advice. the advice I give to anyone who's asking me how to get going I'm like don't send out your first track you ever write just keep writing make like yeah. 10 20 tunes and you'll find that by the time you get to number 10 number one doesn't sound so flash so you know just keep working at it yeah i wanted to know what it's like working in a duo is there still the same chemistry after like 15 years do you guys dj together at all like uh yeah we do we do dj together um especially around uh back at home new zealand australia and uh, sort of bigger festivals um so if we're doing like an edc or something like that then we would we would both go to to dj that um usually just one of us will go through europe because it's more economical Mm -hmm. and it's easier for the agency a booking agency so because of the distances involved you know we live in new zealand so it's a long long way to travel with two people um and yeah 15 years is is quite a long time to be working uh, in a duo um there have been ups and downs you know we've had our share of arguments uh, fights about di- you know creative direction and stuff like that great, uh, they, these yeah. things happen but you know to be honest 90% of the time we are on the same kind of wavelength and the chances are if one of us thinks a tune is good the other one probably thinks it's good and if one of us thinks it's not so great the other one probably feels the same way and you know we've been uh, I guess fortunate that that's how it's been since day one and it's still like that so. I think that leads to your label right some music so you've you, you've signed like I think 15 international producers DJs. What are the pros and cons of running such a label? You know, like you, is it hard to keep everyone happy, or that it just came? Has it just came naturally? You know, like you released stuff and then they came to you because you were doing great music. Uh, well, <laughs> unfortunately, well, fortunately, I don't know. We're not actually doing S O M music anymore. Yeah. Uh, we suspended the label a couple of years ago because we signed exclusively to Blackout, um, right, yeah. and because of that decision, to us it seemed a bit weird to be. Um, you book uh, Black Sun Empire on some music, right, as well. Uh, no, we had we had a couple of collabs with the yeah, Money yeah. yeah. But the thing is that because we were exclusively signed to another label, it meant that we couldn't actually release on our own label, and uh, it seemed really weird to have a label called S O M Music that we went on and so we made the decision to uh you know to not do it anymore and just f- go back to focusing on our own kind of sound and one of the uh driving reasons we had for starting the label in the first place is because we want we wanted to have something that we could put out at, you know anything we liked really uh and help the kind of local scene and, and then when we when i say local i mean in new zealand uh, and then when we signed uh to blackout we're lucky that they pretty much give us the same flexibility that we had on som i mean if we like a tune and we want to put it out then there's a pretty good chance that they'll they'll be fine with it um and then in terms of helping the local scene well that's, <laughs> that's my next question was like is there any new new england new zealand sorry talent? um yeah there is actually there's some do there's uh uh, producers uh, called Floatus. Okay. Um, and Is um, a funk or not really. It's kind of more your kind of Viper sound, okay. uh, Viper recordings okay. kind of sound, or, or kind of Shogunny sound. Uh, but for the most part, um, no. I mean, New Zealand had a real heyday there, where they had us and the Upbeats, Concord Dawn, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Bulletproof, so Trey, Dose. Um, Th- there was a big big wave of like you know and then the kind of the the next wave kind of hasn't really come through i'm not sure why that is i don't know i wanted to know i've actually seen i don't know 10 years ago i saw your like myspace page so now <laughs> i mean like so most people use myspace at, at the start of early 2000s right what about now like you've got 70,000 followers on facebook i think And I just wanted to know, like, what do you think of the, the role of social media uh, for drum and bass producers from like distant destinations like New Zealand? Is it vital, or would you would you recommend using it, or just make you know just making sure you produce enough, and then then maybe get the social media going? Um, look, uh, uh, no, no, that's okay. Yeah, look, I mean, to be honest, I'm pretty. Ent- I'm not a big social media fan. 
um, I'm going to be I'll admit that I'm not a huge user of social media um, it's kind of for, for the way I see it as a necessary evil no. you know you, it's pretty hard to run a, a music brand these days of any kind without having social media and the people that are good at social media I mean it makes a big difference um, there are there are people out there that are more popular for their social media than they are for actually making music yeah. and you know they may they may well be completely manufactured and have a like a PR team the social team or whatever and it is, I mean it is a thing I mean me personally I I don't know like I'm just I'm just not a huge fan of it uh, but I understand that there are other people out there that you know they love social media they live for it and that's cool you know that's just their choice I did did want to talk about the the older tunes like Sunking and Real McCoy so we, we've talked about it at the beginning a little bit and so I wanted to know like um, with Sunking, would you ever get fed up with it? Because I, I don't think people can, you know, because it's such a big tune. So is there some kind of a story behind it, how it came to be or? Um, no, there's not There's not really a story behind it. I mean, it was just a tune that we wrote. Um, in, the, in the big bunch that you And it was on that big bunch right, of tunes, yeah. yeah. And, um, and it kind of was the one that blew up, I guess. And it still has, um, people still kind of love it. Awesome. Which is pretty crazy because it is it is pretty old now, and it, but I guess you know it doesn't matter. There's a lot of old music out there that I still love. Um, do I play it? I don't mean I do play it sometimes. Um, not all the time because I find that because it is quite old, it can sound quite different to the stuff that I play yeah. now. Um, I mean, it'd probably be time to do some sort of a remaster of it or something to you know freshen Whoa, it up a little bit. That. Now we're getting something. But you know, <laughs> if we do that, there's still going to be people that'll be like, yeah, the original's better, you know, and they'll shit on it anyway. So it's kind of a lose lose situation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I still love the tune. I just. Perfect. Like you say, people do ask for it all the time. So whenever someone's like, "Oh, Sun King," it's like, "Okay, yeah. <laughs> cool." Um, okay, so enough of old school, right? Uh, how did you get to remix Fat Boy Slim? I mean, we can talk about this one, right? Yeah. So um, we all like we've heard Paula and Bryce's remix, and then this one, at least for me, came, came out of nowhere. So. Do you, do you like Fat Boy Slim or how, how did you get to, you know, do the remix? Um, well, I mean, first of all, massive Fat Boy Slim fan. Um, for anyone who's kind of um, into electronic music, I think that people like Fat Boy Slim or the Chemical Brothers or the Prodigy or whatever, you can't go past them as being kind of iconic, influential figures in the... In the, in the music I mean it doesn't matter if you like drum bass or house or break whatever you have to respect them as yeah. po- kind of the pioneers of the game and um, so for us to get to do um, a sort of a sanction remix was pretty cool um, I think a part of his uh, model now is as he tours around the world he likes to get um, you know figures from that area yeah. to do a remix of some of his music so that's kind of how it came about like BMG came to us and they were like he's coming through New Zealand and Australia would you like to do a remix and we said yeah. we said hell yeah and we'll do how a remix like such a it was it was quite difficult actually because you know we did Star 69 we chose Star 69 primarily because uh, I actually bootlegged out that vocal sample yeah. and back in the day I used to tease that over the top of tracks and and mess around with it so it seemed kind of like the logical one to choose we had the pretty much option to choose whatever track um, but we chose that one Um, and it was quite tricky because that's a totally different tempo and it's kind of not in a key that works particularly well with drum bass um, in general and I've heard it yesterday yeah well we we had to do we had to do we had to do a bit of work on it to you know to, to yeah. fit it into drum bass right. but um, okay. it was also funny because we just literally got given one file that was recorded from the old dat tape so we had to oh, like okay. sit there and edit out all the samples and yeah. the noise and then you know and then go from there so it took some work but yeah I think we got there maybe the last one okay so your second album Less Than Light uh, what I've read that, that it reached Faster, sorry, faster than light. Yeah, it it reached number five on iTunes and number eleven on the New Zealand Top Forty. That sounds about right. Yeah. Right, right. Would you consider that your one of your biggest achievements? I mean, because it's kind of big. Drum and bass would never get into like top ten, top forty in the Czech Republic, even though it is quite popular here. Um, yeah, I mean that was that album actually sold really well, and it it still kind of sells. 
um, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that is an achievement. I mean, I completely forgot all about it, to be honest. So you've reminded me of something. Um, but it was also pretty cool. And our, our album, Eat the Rich, uh, our last album that won the John Bass Arena Award yeah. for Album of the Year. So that was pretty cool. That was kind of like bouncing back because our album in between those two albums it didn't do so good. So it was cool to kind of bounce back like that and, um, you know, come out the gates swinging hard. So it's been four years since your last album? Yeah, it, 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 it has. It's been four so years. There's something cooking? There's a new one coming, oh, yeah. It should be coming, it should be coming, uh, well, sometime May, sometime around May or June this year. It's like, the idea is we've done those EPs, Land of the Blind, part one and part two. But the idea is that the actual, the Land of the Blind album will come in May with some of the best tunes from those EPs plus a whole swag of new material to kind of complete the album. And that's what we've been working towards. Good luck. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Summer, summer, winter? Ah, uh, summer. Summer, so surf or skate? Surf. Surf. Kiwi, I mean the fruit or pineapple? Pineapple. Pineapple. Yeah. Aussie rules or rugby? <laughs> Fucking rugby all day, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, blondes or gingers? Probably gingers, actually. Gingers. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Beer or wine? Beer. Beer, okay. Rum or whiskey? Neither. Neither. So what's your poison? V- uh, vodka. Vodka. Nice. Yeah. There you go. Uh, NBC or AMC? Ah, uh, ooh. I don't know if I should. I don't know if I should answer that. I might get in trouble with someone. So I'm gonna have to. I'll plead the fifth that on that one. Okay, I had I had another one was Noisy or Blacks on Empire. I have to plead the fifth on that one as well, mate. Play, PlayStation or Xbox? Uh, PlayStation, but I don't have much time for right. gaming, unfortunately. I get like maybe one hour a week, which is. So maybe PUBG or Fortnite? I can't stand Fortnite, mate. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Cool. Cheers. No worries. Oh,